In this video, I'm going to look at two specific types of reaction, which are known as exothermic and endothermic reactions. Exo and endothermic reactions. Now, the reason why we look at both of these is because they are pretty much opposite to each other. Thermic, you will have heard of thermals. You know, you can get thermal clothing, and that's to keep heat in. Thermal energy is actually to do with heat. The thermic just means heat. And the exo means giving out. Giving out. And endo means taking in. So we've got heat, giving out heat, or taking in heat. Now there is a very common misconception here that I want to clear up straight away. Exothermic, when it says giving out heat, that means whatever you are um, talking about is heating up. So if you have a beaker where a reaction is occurring and that reaction is exothermic, then that reaction is giving out heat, which means the solution in the beaker will heat up. And it means if, for example, it's, it's an open beaker, then your surroundings will also heat up. Endothermic, and I think this is where the confusion really comes in. Endothermic, when it says taking in heat, it doesn't mean that the beaker takes in heat and becomes hotter. It means the chemicals in the equation are actually taking in heat, the energy from heat, and converting it into something else. So that means the heat, which has been taken in, is no longer heat. So it's been converted into chemical energy. Because it's no longer heat, that means the temperature will go down because the heat is no longer there and the energy has been converted into something else. So taking in heat does not mean getting hotter. It's not like if we drink a cup of hot tea, um, the inside of our mouth is gonna get hotter. That's not the same, that's not a useful analogy of an endothermic reaction. A useful analogy would be if you eat a, if you've ever eaten a really strong mint and then you drink water afterwards, it feels really cold. That's because an endothermic reaction has reduced the temperature of your mouth. The chemicals have taken the heat away and turned it into something else. But that means the chemicals themselves have taken in the heat and now it is no longer heat. So that's something really important that I want to clear up straight away because it confused me when I was at school and a lot of my students have the same problem. So we'll say temperature up and temperature down. Now, let's have a look at a example, an example of a reaction which you will be way familiar with by now, which is combustion. This is methane. If I have methane in oxygen and I burn it, I'm gonna get CO2 plus H2O. Now, combustion is an exothermic reaction. That means that it is going to give out heat. So if you burn a fuel, the burning of the fuel will release even more heat than you supplied originally. That's one common misconception as well. We don't take a massive temperature, burn the fuel in it, and then that's it, because then where does the energy come from? We burn fuels to get energy, and that energy is normally in the form of heat. And so we burn the fuel, and then the chemical reaction, being exothermic, causes a massive increase in the temperature. So it's releasing even more heat than we supplied originally. So we are giving off heat, and therefore this is an exothermic reaction exothermic reaction. Now, rather than look at uh, a mint in your mouth or sherbet in your mouth, let's have a look at a reaction that you have actually studied before, which is actually an endothermic reaction. So if you have calcium carbonate, let's do it in a different color. So calcium carbonate, and we heat it up, we are going to form calcium oxide, this is a thermal decomposition. Sorry, not oxygen gas, carbon dioxide. That's my mistake. This is a thermal decomposition. Okay, so we are heating this up. So remember, heat is not a chemical, so we put it here. Heating it up, and we're gonna form calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. 
And so why isn't this exothermic? Because we're adding heat here. Well, the reason we add heat in this case is to persuade calcium carbonate to break down. When it does break down, the temperature will go down. And the reason for that is that we've taken that thermal energy in the form of heat and we have converted it into chemical energy in the form of bonds which make up our products. So these products actually required extra energy in order for those to be able to exist. That extra energy has come from the heat that we've added. And therefore, this is an endothermic reaction because they've taken some heat and they've turned it into something else. And therefore, we have less heat left and the temperature will go down. So this is an endothermic endothermic reaction. And so moving on slightly from this, you can have situations where exo and endothermic reactions are in fact related. Now, if we have a crystal, a salt, known as, well, this is copper sulfate, but we can also have hydrated copper sulfate. And exactly as it sounds, that means it also has water in it. We can heat that and we will form copper sulfate, which is not hydrated, which we actually call anhydrous copper sulfate, plus our five waters, which we've now lost. Now, this is a very similar reaction uh, to the thermal decomposition that we've just looked at. So you add heat. So let's put heat here. So you add heat and you are going to produce anhydrous copper sulfate and water. The heat has been taken into these, uh, these substances and therefore the heat being taken in and converted into something else causes the temperature to go down. And so this reaction, let's put that in red, this reaction is endothermic. I'm just going to write endo there. Okay. Now, if we take our anhydrous copper sulfate and we add water to it, so the water here has been given off and it's likely given off as a gas. So if we take our anhydrous copper sulfate and we add water to it, we will hydrate the copper sulfate and form hydrated copper sulfate. And so that is the exact opposite of this reaction. So we add water and we get heat given off. So heat being given off means that it is exothermic and the temperature will therefore go back up. And so this direction is exothermic. Okay, so this is combining uh, reversible reactions, which you've seen before, with exo and endothermic. So they're like two sides of the same coin. Now, something more interesting is that the amount of heat that we take in in the endothermic reaction is exactly equal to the amount that we will give off in the exothermic reaction. And that makes sense because if it's reversible, it means we can go to exactly what we started with the other way. And so if we are adding, let's say, for example, it's completely made up, let's add five kilojoules this way. So it's five kilojoules of energy, endothermic. It will be five kilojoules this way, so negative five kilojoules, exothermic. Okay, don't worry about those figures or anything at the moment. Just, just to, um, to paint a picture in your head that exo and endothermic in a reversible reaction, they are going to be equal and opposite. And that really comes down to the laws of physics and that we can't magically create or destroy energy. We can just convert it from one form to another. Okay, last thing to mention about this reaction is that it is actually a useful test for water. Because if we add um, a substance, which we don't know whether it contains water or not, to anhydrous copper sulfate, which is white. That's the reason I've drawn these colours. Anhydrous copper sulfate is actually a white crystal. So let's just draw that. If we've got all these crystals of anhydrous copper sulfate and we add water, what we will end up with is these blue crystals of hydrated copper sulfate. And so if there's water present, we are going to see quite a drastic color change from white to blue. And so that is why it is a good test for water. 
Okay, so I'll stop there. I hope you found that useful. If you do have any questions, please feel free to email me or comment in the box below. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video.